Uh, I gave an update on the combination of anti ctl 4 and anti-PD-1 uh, used to treat advanced disease, primarily melanoma, but other diseases, and also uh, to give a talk on uh, endpoints for those kinds of trials. They're both immune checkpoints. Uh, CTLA-4 and PD-1 are receptors on T cells. They come up when T cells are activated, and when they bind to their ligands, they basically shut down the function of T cells. But they work at different parts of T cell differentiation and function. Um, it turns out that if you inhibit those receptors, um, you activate a very strong immune response against cancer. I think it may become the dominant form of uh, treatment for cancer over the coming years. If you start looking at all the activity of anti-PD-1, uh, it's now active in six or seven different diseases. In melanoma, it'll be the, the dominant form of therapy. So I think very important. Um, I think uh, investigators will be using these therapies for many years to come. They're both antibodies. One, one is uh, an antibody that blocks CTLA-4. The other one is an antibody that blocks PD-1. Uh, CTLA-4 comes up on the surface when a T cell is activated. Uh, PD-1 does also. Um, we believe that CTLA-4 works more in the lymph node to inhibit T cell activation, and the PD-1 works more in the tumor microenvironment to inhibit T cell function there. Um, but again, they're both blocking antibodies at this point. Now, there are multiple antibodies that block PD-1. Uh, and there's at least two antibodies that block CTLA-4. And there are also antibodies that block the ligand for PD-1, PD-L1. Right now, the combinations involve nivolumab and ipilimumab. Um, but there are combinations of tremolimumab, which is another anti-CTLA-4, with MEDI 4736, which is an anti-PD-L1. So those are also in clinical trials. They do different things. So they, they work at different points in T cell differentiation and function. Um, and the hypothesis is that when you block both, you get better T cell activation and function. And in fact, that's the case. We saw better clinical activity. And actually, the correlative study suggests that they do something different. Actually, when you combine both drugs, um, it becomes almost like a different drug. We've done the gene therapy studies. The DADAP cars have done that at our institution. And the gene. Uh, uh, signature of T cells that are activated by anti-PD-1 is different than that activated by anti-CTLA-4. And when you put the two together, you get a whole different set of genes that are produced uh, or, or, or expressed in T cells. So they're clearly different drugs working by different mechanisms, even though they're similar, and they produce a different output when you put them together. Most of the toxicities are anti-CTLA-4 related. Um, when you put the two together, it looks like giving the higher dose of anti-CTLA-4. It looks like you're giving 10 milligrams per kilogram of anti-CTLA-4, which, by the way, has been used in many clinical trials. Physicians have learned to manage. Um, but there's no question that when the two are put together, the toxicities are worse than you would see with either agent alone. We know how to manage these toxicities well. There are algorithms in place. There are some patients who get very sick, but, but again, it's, uh, it's been, um, there's a lot of clinical experience now learning how to manage these toxicities well. Really, other than managing the adverse events, no, there are financial issues. These are two very expensive drugs. So um, uh, the results of the phase three studies really will have to show that they're substantially better than either single agent uh, in order to justify the cost. Um, it's also possible that you could use these agents sequentially for example. And it's also true that some patients will respond optimally just to one of those agents. So in the best of all possible worlds, you would want to select patients for those who could respond best to the single agents. And then if, if somehow or another you knew that they would not respond optimally to the single agents, you would give them the combination. You would justify the increased cost and increased expense. I believe that at this point, the adverse events related to the, uh, to the use of the combination may preclude adjuvant therapies. Wouldn't preclude, but I think at this point, adjuvant therapies will probably look at the single agents first, and then down the road, perhaps look at the combinations.
when we do clinical trials, especially early phase clinical trials, we're looking for activity that might impact on the survival curve. And traditionally that's been uh, resist responses or progression-free survival. The, the difficult thing with these agents is that there are uh, many patients who develop unconventional responses that may actually impact on the survival curve. So mixed responses, for example, patients will develop a new lesion that will then digress or they'll have mixed responses, but it's, it's, it's definitely not resist responses. And you may see a fair number of these uh, in a clinical trial. In fact, in the combination study, maybe 15 to 25 percent of patients in that range had unconventional responses, and we really believe that contributed to the survival curve. Now, there are people, Dr. Wolchuk published an article some years ago on the immune-related response criteria to try and take into account these unconventional responses. And so I think that when companies and investigators do phase two trials, you have to look at those unconventional responses and factor that into your decision whether you want to take this regimen further into phase three or not. It's, it's just a, a matter of measuring activity in a different way than we're used to uh, uh, based on, for example, chemotherapy agents. Not, in, not in so much in terms of measuring response. I mean, it may be useful in terms of predicting who might respond or not. So there's a very interesting paper in the New England Journal, also from the Memorial Sloan Kettering Group, that identified a neoantigen signature based on C, uh, exome sequencing that might predict who might respond to CTLA-4 or not. Um, but in terms of assessing ultimate response to these agents, it's still a clinical judgment based on CAT scans and assessment of patient outcome. I think we've only looked at, at these agents in two or three diseases. Or it's being evaluated in many more diseases, so there's a lot of data to come. And I think it's important to realize this may not even be the optimal combination. There are lots of other uh, ways to stimulate and also to block inhibitory pathways in T cells. And a lot of those other combinations merit development. And I think as more of those agents come into clinical trials, we're going to see some very interesting uh, clinical results.